just so you, you understand, I always talk in stories. And that's just how I am. If I was going to tell my mother Diana's story, uh, where would I start? By all accounts, she should be dead. By all accounts, nothing that she's attempted in her life should have worked. There may be elements of this that are hard to believe. That would probably be the way I would preface it. You know, her story is an unbelievable story that goes against all the odds. For someone to have grown up like that in America and be where she is today is, is mind-boggling. Truthfully, I couldn't really tell her story uh, because it's only her story to tell. The more time I spent with Diana, the more I saw all the things that make people so enamored with her and so in awe of her. Diana, she's different. It's not, I've worked for a lot of people in my lifetime, but she is totally different. I mean, like daylight and dark from everybody. Working for Diana, you trust Diana. You just say, if Diana says so, then that's how it is. Hello, I'm Diana Wright, and I'm the owner and the founder of The Wright Solutions. And I just want to tell you today, I am so humbled and so honored to have received the 2015 Best Nurse of the Year Award. I grew up as the only daughter of very bad parents. And when I say that my father was an alcoholic and my mother was mentally ill, my mother was extremely abusive, an extremely obese cigarette smoker who cursed every, every other word. And I mean, she could string together curse words that, number one, would make a sailor blush. Number two, never made any sense. We had extreme poverty. When I was a year and a half old, my dad left. My mother was pregnant with my younger brother, and um, I have two older brothers. I started reading at four. Nobody sat down with me and taught me how to read. I would ask my mother different words, and she would always just tell me. And so I, I, I just figured it all out. I learned to cook at six years old because my mother burned everything. Everything every day was burned. In that same year, at that same time, I went out and because I was hungry, I took my little pail and my shovel and my neighbor had turnips in his garden. I did not realize that food belonged to a certain person, that he had actually planted it. I was digging up the turnips and he came up and he said, what are you doing, baby? And I said, getting me something to eat. Yeah. I don't know why this makes me limp. Anyway, so I, I dug up a, a pail of turnips and I took it to my mother. You'd think of two small children eating turnips and turtle greens, and you think, oh, they wouldn't eat that. Listen, when you have nothing, you're happy to eat turnips. I would always have to like make the beds be, and, and clean the house. And none of the boys ever had to do that because they were men. Men didn't do women's work. She would take an open coat hanger and she would just, I mean, cause it opens up almost three foot and she would start just hitting you like it was a whip. And if she didn't get the right amount of blood, she would just gouge it in like this. I can't imagine a mother doing such a thing, but my mother did. My mother was not normal. My second brother, Gary, was a lot like my mother. He was psychotic, he was mean, he was hateful. He was always doing terrible things, terrible things to us. Gary was always supposed to babysit. And the way Gary babysit, he would tie, tie my hands behind my back to my brother's hands and lay us on the bed. And it didn't matter if we wet our pants or what we did because he didn't really care. Another time, he took all my dolls and he put them up on the, above the door on a ledge. 
and our ledges were deep. It's almost shelves above the door. And so we put the dolls up there, and here I am under him throwing knives at my dolls. He was laughing maniacally as he threw knives as I was in the door crying, trying to reach my dolls. He thought that was the funniest thing in the world. All the money that we ever got went to novels and went to cigarettes. The only way she would pay the rent is when the rent was overdue and she never paid any utilities. And that's why I took over paying everything at 11 because I was just tired of everything being cut off. I would spend long hours daydreaming about a better life and how I was gonna make a difference in my life and how I was going to work my way out of, out of the situation. Okay, so this is my office. I've got my certifications up on the wall. So I've got my nursing degree, my MBA. This one is my family. I've got 17 grandchildren and four children. Up above, I've got the best place to work in 2017 and I scored it again in 2018. All those awards right there are nurse, nurse of the year. But this is the one I'm really proud of. So I was eating at a restaurant. We were sitting down at the table when the guy next to me falls over and does a head plant into his food. He's like six, two or three, weighs probably about 250 pounds. And so in my best Terminator voice, I turn around and I point at a redheaded guy because I'd read this story that if you just ask for help, no one will help you. But if you actually point out someone, they will. So I, I yelled at this guy. I said, on your feet, soldier, right now, get him on the floor. And he just jumped up and grabbed the guy and put him on the floor. So I started CPR on the guy. There were, eating lunch, two ER doctors, two ICU nurses, two respiratory therapists. We shocked him for about, oh, I don't even know, maybe 12, 15 times. The most I've ever, ever shocked anybody in my life and did not think he made it. I left just feeling sick because I thought, you know, another one had died. A few weeks later, I got a thank you note from the guy that I, that I had done the CPR on and he had lived. And then I got this senatorial commendation and got a letter from an Oklahoma senator that was having lunch with him and we saved his life. And he um, got back to work and in a week and was doing fine. At the age of 11, I started cleaning other people's houses. At the age of 12, I started babysitting. At the age of 13, I was babysitting, cleaning houses, and my brother and I had a, a paper route that we ran at night. He and I saved up $50 and went and bought an old yellow uh, Studebaker that was standard, and he could fix it. So we got it running, and that's what we would run on our paper route at night and he would drive at 11, and I would wrap and throw papers. I was about 15 when I went to work for the first time, and I went to work for a shoe store in Shreveport, Louisiana. I moved out at the age of 17, and my standard of living went straight up from the second I moved out of the house. I didn't finish going to high school. I had two jobs, and I worked as a waitress in the morning from six to two. Then from 2.30 to eight, I worked at a drugstore. When I was working at the drugstore, there was this pharmacist, and he was very influential on my life. And so this pharmacist said, well, you gotta go to pharmacy school. He said, you gotta go get your GED, you gotta get your ACT, you gotta go to college. I couldn't sit my GED until my birthday. On my birthday, I went down and I set my GED and I scored, you know, 100%. I was going to set my ACT the next day. In Louisiana, they had 18-year-old drinking. So I thought, you know, I'm going to be legal to drink. It doesn't really make sense to go home and go to sleep when I've got to get up and be there at 7 o'clock 
and I want to go out drinking tonight, so I'll just, I'll just stay up all night. So I stayed up all night and drank all night and went to my ACT and passed it. And so I graduated with my GED and my ACT before my class did. And I went on and went to college when they went to college. Being at the right solutions has changed my entire life of who I am. I mean, it's always been there. I just needed someone to believe in me and bring it out. And Diana done that. And at the company, if you reached a goal, we got a trip and we were going to Vegas and it wasn't legal to get married here. I was going to surprise Bree with a wedding there. And I told Diana about it and I said, well, I'm not telling her till we get there. And Diana's like, well, you can't do that. And I'm like, why? <laughs> she said, because she has to have the opportunity to get a dress. Well, because we both work there. Diana just paid for our wedding at the chapel. And Diana told her, she said, I don't care if you are attached to Robin Clark, I will fire you. I fired my own daughter. And I told Brie, I said, and she will, period. I got married at 18, and I married my high school sweetheart, a gentleman named <laughs> I was a freshman in college, and I got married at Christmas because I was pregnant. He was exactly like my mother. He was what I knew at the time. Very, very negative, abusive. I came home from work one day, and he was sitting in the living room um, cutting drugs with another young man. I mean, when I'm talking about drugs in my living room, I'm not talking about a little bit. I'm talking about like 40 or 50 pounds of drugs in my living room. And I was pregnant, and I just said, blood's thicker than water. I'm not gonna lose my child because of you. I was used to talking people down from their crazy behavior, so I'm really good at that. So I could always talk down. I just said, you've got till this evening to pick them up and get them out of here, or I'm calling the police and having you arrested. I mean, it was a freaking mess at that time. It was just drugs everywhere. So I had my daughter, and here she was, a tiny, tiny baby. And he would come home and he would say things like, get your thing out of my living room. And I just decided I'm not putting up with this anymore. And I packed up my six month old and I moved out. You know, business is tough and small business is tough and growing into a medium into a larger size business is, is not easy. And, and most people don't make it. Early on, you know, she knew what, what needed to happen. She knew what her goals were. She knew what it would take to build a successful business and through her hard work ethic and her perseverance, Diana didn't give up. If I could get out and get in front of someone and not talk business, then I knew I would close them. If I had to talk business, then I knew we wouldn't close. And so I would walk into their office, I would take one look around quickly and they, somebody is gonna have in their office what they're passionate about. And maybe it's their family, maybe it's golf, maybe it's nursing, maybe it's tennis, whatever it was, I learned that that was what I would talk about, whatever they were happy talking about. And that would give them a good feeling about me. And they would do all the talking and I would do the question asking. And they would think I was a great conversationalist. And I did the same thing when I, when I dated, I had written out a list of 20 questions because I held basically a job interview. Well, all the guys were totally enamored quickly because I would be, oh, tell me about yourself and tell, now, how did you grow up? And I would only ask open-ended questions about them. She's very pretty and she was getting a college degree. She has, probably told you she had criteria who she wanted. I had in my mind that I wanted a suit, I wanted an attorney, I wanted certain things, and none of those guys could answer any of my questions. Mostly she needed lawyer type people and they were sort of self-centered and that kind of stuff. I'd say, do you want children? Uh, no. I'd say, tell me about what you own, would not own a thing. Tell me about what you paid off never paid off anything. Mom and Daddy gave them everything. And I was like, I got a headache, I need to go home. My best friend from fifth grade was dating a young man named Butch. Butch had been living with David. The friend I worked with had a trailer, so she 
was dropped off by her mother, came in, she had still had curlers in her hair. And, and there was David, and he didn't look a thing like anything I had in mind. I was in the room, but you know, I really wasn't being acknowledged at the time. We all went to dinner, and he didn't open his mouth, did not say a word. And he wore khaki. He wore khaki pants and a khaki shirt. And when you're blonde and tanned and you wear khaki, that fades you all out. And so I was like, mm, I don't want him. I had criteria too. I didn't want somebody that was, you know, focused in on me. And I wanted them to have their own life, their own career. It was the following Christmas. I had another break. I called Butch back up and I said, another semester of nursing school is down and I need to date. Butch lied to me and he said, I've got this guy you can go out with, but you need someone that can buy you dinner. So I showed up and we drove over to David's house and we knocked on the door and Trisha is behind me going, be nice, be nice, be nice, as he opened the door. And he had been warned that he better wear navy blue and jeans and not be wearing that khaki shirt and that khaki pants. And so he did look a lot better. He looked blonde and blue eyed. And so that book down there has mine and David's. It's a diary of our, our dating. Okay. Valentine's Day, 1980. I thought our relationship was headed nowhere, and David thought he was one of the boys when he inadvertently sent me a very sexy Valentine's Day card. That was before I knew he didn't read the cards. He just picked them out by whatever they had on the front cover. <laughs> he also sent a cute card to Dana. She was a baby at that time. <laughs> and that changed the way I thought about him. We never kissed prior to Valentine's Day. Sometime shortly after that, we met, we had a date, and David and I would talk, mostly I talked and David listened. I walked David to the door and he kissed me. It was a, a great kiss and that changed our relationship. Well, I still have that, it's Snoopy on the front, and when you open it up, it's a pop-up. I told her that, you know, I didn't even look inside the card, but I did. It says, when I see you, I get really excited. I don't think I would have kissed him if I hadn't got that card. That's what changed the course of our relationship. A typical day in nursing would be um, if you are working in a hospital to get an assignment of patients, um, figure out um, what needs to be done within that period of time and deliver that care in the best way that you can, including medications, including family members needing assistance and or comfort. I went and immediately to work as an ICU nurse. Well, I went and talked to the director of nurses first when I was being hired. I said, you know, I've got the four-year degree, but I don't want to be alone in charge of the ICU. Here's where I messed up. I said, I want to work with an experienced nurse. Now, I did not say I would like to work with an experienced ICU nurse. So day one, shift one, I'll go into the ICU and I see this woman who I think is so old, she's like 35 and I'm like 23. I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I'm so lucky there's gonna be an, an experienced nurse tonight. And she turned around and looked at me and she goes, I'm so glad you're here. I know you're in charge because you're the experienced ICU nurse. I go, but aren't you the experienced nurse? And she goes, of course, I've been a nurse for 12 years and I am experienced, but this is the first night I've ever worked ICU. And I got so upset. I was like, oh my God, we're gonna kill our patient. And she goes, calm down. You were gonna be just fine. The doctor is asleep across the hall, and if we get into a bond, we'll call him and he'll come help us. When I worked as a nurse, from the minute I hit the floor to the minute I went home, I didn't get to eat, I didn't get to go to the bathroom. I ran the entire night. You might be giving a patient a bath, and washing their hair, and shaving their face, changing their linen, giving them their breakfast, making them fresh coffee, giving them pills. I went from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet, 
Their pupils are equal and reactive to light. There's nothing in their nose, no drainage. I note everything. And then at the end, after I gave report, I walk back through and make sure that nobody was in a dirty bed, nobody had knocked over their water, nobody had messed up their room. Everyone who was in a position of authority would take one look at me, and there I was in my scrubs and my long white lab coat with my name on it. I looked like I was in charge. And so I got to be in charge. <laughs> I never thought about having things because my concern was always for people. And my concern was always for my nurses and always for my in-house staff. And so I did all this not for me. I never thought about me. It was always for them. I wanted them to have a good place to work in. And I wanted them like, like to have this big kitchen so they could all get together and congregate in this kitchen. I never really thought about it being for me. If it was for me, it wouldn't look like this. First off, it wouldn't be modern at all because I don't like modern. I did this because they all like modern. And I hate gray. Gray is my least favorite color, so I would not do anything gray, but they all say, oh, you know, gray is so expensive and so nice. I would never do gray. <laughs> it would always be color. I had made it to the top of a hospital as a, a assistant director of nurses. The only other position I could get would be a director of nurses. I was very unhappy at that moment in time because my job was to make sure that all the staff was staffed in all of the areas of the hospital. And when I called the agency, I would call and request a certain nurse. I mean, I might need an ER nurse and they might send me a labor and delivery nurse and they would never send me what I needed. But now I decided, you know what? I could do that a whole lot better. And so I went home and I did what I always do, was I set down a goal that I wanted to own an agency. One of the steps was to get my MBA because I did not want to mess up. Another was to get certified in healthcare quality because I wanted to know how to credential people, which I needed to know to be able to put a nurse in the hospital. I was working my plan. And I've had other people look at my plan and say, you know, none of this makes sense. Well, no, not for you, but for me, it makes perfect sense. I'm working my plan. While I got my MBA, I was months away from finishing. I went to work for the VA hospitals in Shreveport, Louisiana. Okay, you know what? Let me go back just a little bit because this is another interesting story. I would entertain myself by going on job interviews. And I would go on all these job interviews as, and I would consider them practice interviews. My goal was to figure out what they're asking and to get them to like me enough to offer me the job so I could turn it down. The VA had run an ad for a quality manager and I went in a, and applied and got interviewed. Well, I didn't know anything about quality management. This was a, a four month process. And so to prep myself for the job interview because I knew nothing about it, I went to the library and I did a little bit of research and then I went in and I interviewed and interviewed well. Her saying is, you know, I can fake it till I make it. Yeah, so, so she might not know what she's doing, but she can sure you know, put on a good front. I went just to interview after interview after interview, talked to all these people, and every time I talked to somebody, I'd go research a little more, and I sounded like I knew what I was talking about, and they hired me. The MBA instructor, his big thing was that you can be an expert on anything in one week. I didn't know anything about quality when I came to work for the VA. I'd work on every department, audiology, respiratory, lab, and by the time I got through, I would know everything. What really disillusioned me with the VA was that their year starts October 1st every year. And so they would start running out of money in September and their answer running out of money was to quit seeing patients. And that went against me as a practitioner, against my 
um, the way I would want to do things, but it really also went against all the doctors too, to the point that one of the doctors at one point held himself up in his office with a gun. And here we had a health for a psychiatrist and psychologist, and you know, I was good friends with all these people. And who did they call to go deal with him? Because he was his best friend, they called me. He was bright red in the face, and he had both his hands, he was sitting at his desk, and he had both his hands up on his head, and the gun, you know, on the desk right here, and he was just sitting here, he was so distressed. And I just said, you are fixing to have a heart attack. And I just put on my nurse demeanor and I said, let me take your blood pressure. And it was sky high. And I said, put that gun away. I said, we've got to take care of problems first. And the first problem is we're not gonna be upset today about patient care. I went in and talked him down. I used my talking down mode. What had distressed him so badly was that he had a patient with lung cancer that he wanted to have surgery done on this patient. And he knew that if we waited six weeks that he would die. They had hurried up and spent all the money so the patients were the ones that were losing. When I worked for the VA, it's when I started uh, wearing suits and, and heels. I always bought all my clothes at Goodwill, but I would make sure that I had the nice brands. I can remember one day I was in the cafeteria at the VA eating alone, and this man came up to me and he said, you dress impeccably. Every day I look at you, and I cannot believe how well-dressed you are. He was a partner in a medical staffing firm, unbeknownst to me. And the next thing I know, he and I went to business. Quit working at the VA on a Friday, and I started with TriTech on a Monday. TriTech was a respiratory firm at that time. When you talk about respiratory therapy, you're talking about 2% of a hospital is respiratory therapy. 73% of a hospital is nursing. And so you're talking about a lot less opportunity. I said, why are we chasing something with no opportunity when we could be staffing 73%? And they were like, oh, never thought of it that way. And within, I would say about a week, I had more nurses than they ever had respiratory therapists. They went from working in, you know, out of their home until, until they, next thing they know, they had like 20 or 30 employees. What happened is every time a check was processed, the check wasn't actually mailed. And so the taxes were not being paid. There were other things not being paid. And when I found out about it, I t immediately turned in my letter of resignation. When I joined these guys, they made me sign a piece of paper. You can never own what we started in Shreveport, Louisiana. Well, I still had that paper. I produced that, that said I didn't have an equal share, I never owned anything. I had a non-compete agreement and I honored that. And when that was over, then I went ahead and started my agency, The Right Solutions. Diana is unconventional. She doesn't, uh, she doesn't necessarily take what, you know, she sees on TV or what she's heard as fact. She wants to do the discovery for herself. Diana believed in what she was doing and she knew that given enough time, she could, she could become fairly successful at it. I think that she far uh, exceeded everybody's expectations. I worked 24 hours a day to get my business started. I went and bought all the popcorn at Sam's Hop Off and I, I delivered it to, as a New Year's gift all the hospitals in the area because I had no money and I had no shifts and so I had to do what I had to do. Everyone was thrilled that I was dropping off a New Year's Eve gift on New Year's Eve. Well, we got our first shift. I was working by myself. The hospitals would call and I'd go, oh yes, I'll, let me make some phone calls and I'll call you right back with the nurse. And I would hang up, I'd call them right back and they'd say, I have a nurse. Her name is Diana Wright, 
that she will be right there as soon as she can get there. I put up my uniform and I go out the door. I was running around like a chicken with her head cut off. Phones ringing off the hook. I had had a hospitals that were calling me day and night, 24 hours a day. There was no sleeping. And Dana got a week off for a spring break. And I didn't have time to train Dana. She was 19 at the time, and I just set her down at one of my desks I had assembled and with a phone on it. And there was a big stack of nurse resumes that they had sent in. And she's looking at everything, and she goes, if you had more nurses, you'd have more to staff. I go, yeah, yeah, I'm going to get to that. Now, I don't know when. And she had all these nurses that had applied, and um, I just got on the phone and was calling nurses. She called them all, scheduled them in. Uh, she doubled my business in one week. And then I said, ah, I'm going to have to hire a second person. I was furious over the way that nurses were being treated here in Arkansas. Because people don't go to college for four years to clean up poop and throw up for $11 an hour. The reason that they were able to artificially hold the wages low was because there was no um, highway between Fayetteville and uh, Fort Smith, and there was no highway between Fayetteville and Tulsa, and they just open those. What that did was it took a trip to Fayetteville down from two and a half hours to an hour. And so it made it doable. And it took the drive to Fort Smith down from an hour and a half to 39 minutes. So I pulled all the nurses out of Arkansas. I sent them all to Oklahoma. And I undercut all the other agencies in, in Tulsa to staff my Arkansas nurses, which I could do because they were used to making no money. I would pay them $22 an hour if they would guarantee me two 16-hour shifts, and I didn't care what days, and I would give five days off. I would pay $2 an hour for their gas over there and back. You can wonder who signed up. Let me tell you, everybody signed up. So by doing that, uh, automatically the hospitals here came up to $18 an hour from a, a wage of 11 At this point, I was still a per diem company. What this means is that I would go to work every day with nothing, and I would schedule 10,000 hours, and we would have like New York Stock Exchange in our office. Somebody would be marking on a, a whiteboard. We would be screaming orders. A doctor's hospital needs. This nursing home needs. This nurse will take this, this, and this. Erase that. There was a whole room full of us screaming. I would go home and cook, and I, I would spend time with my husband and my children. She always worked all day and then came home and cooked a full meal. Like, we never ate fast food. We never went out to eat. So she was always working or with us girls. We always had craft projects going. We were always in the kitchen cooking. I'd get home from cheerleading or gymnastics, and we'd watch a movie together. If we ever did anything to get grounded, this was my mother. You're not gonna spend time sitting in the corner. You'll be ungrounded when you can do 10 loads of laundry, five loads of dishes, and go pick a chore your dad needs done. So your grounding is completely up to you. So even, even as small children, just something negative, like having to punish your children, she made sure that it was in a way to help her get ahead for that day, you know? And then I would get them bathed and into bed and then I'd start calling nurses until midnight. I'd come back to work the next day and have it canceled off. Staffing per diem was like, you staff them, shift get canceled, you had to find them another shift. Even though we were booking 10,000 hours, I would wind up scheduling about 5,000 a week. As time ticked on, I became less and less enchanted with per diem work. Then she came in one day and said she wanted to do travel. It was the same amount of work to schedule someone for one shift as it is for one travel contract. 
I met Diane in 2000, somewhat by chance. I happened to meet her daughter, and she told me I should stop by and see her mother, that she you know, had some sales positions open and um, told me about her business. That turned into you know, an interview, and then I was hired. We were in a small little building. Uh, at the time, it was really a house that they worked out of, probably 20 to 23 employees, something like that. The day that he was supposed to come to work, we had a huge snow. So I was so happy thinking that no one would be there but me and I would get so much done. And I showed up at the office at 7.30 in the morning and lo and behold, Jimmy Bilby is sitting there. That She was kind of looking forward to the fact I probably wasn't going to make it in and she wasn't going to have to do orientation and onboarding that day. Um, and so I showed up and she said, oh, you know, I really didn't have a plan. So why don't you go in this room and take this hospital blue book and a legal pad and start calling hospitals in California because I'm curious if they use travelers and I'm thinking about sending some of my per diem nurses out on travel. Uh, and I said, Jimmy, just to start calling California, and when you get some contracts, we'll send them out. A couple weeks went by, and the snow and ice did not leave, and so I stayed in my little office and um, just called hospitals, and every hospital in California at the time used travel nurses. Every day I'd check on him, and I'd go, how you doing? He'd go, just fine. I'd go, okay, and I'd walk off. Travel nursing began really as kind of a 13-week travel contract to fill in vacancies for whatever reason they might exist. On Christmas Eve, Jimmy comes to me, and he goes, I think we should send these contracts out. And so I'm so excited. And I clap my hands and I go, oh, you got one. He goes, no, I have 35. You what? And he goes, I think we gotta send these out. That changed the entire course of my business because I had only done face-to-face -face marketing at that point in time. And really that's how travel began is just the concept and her idea of, you know, looking into that and, and being open and, and willing to pursue that. In about a year, um, it grew to the point we were able to convert from per diem staffing to travel only. And it was at that time that Diana built a new 7,000, down a 7,500 7, square foot building out in front of the old house that we had worked in and um, grown in. And uh, that was the beginning. So the attempted hit on my mom, yeah, I actually thought she was exaggerating, um, but um, she wasn't. I was in high school and dad did his typical thing where he was being a man and working outside and he came in, mom was still at work because that was pretty typical during that time. You were getting your business off the ground and Lo and behold, I look out the window because I hear all these bangs and booms and it sounds like World War III and the barn's completely engulfed in flame. So dad turns to me and he says, do not tell your mother. Well, the second he got out of the house, the first thing I did was call my mother. <laughs> and it's like, mom, that barn is burning down. It's completely engulfed. Everything's blowing up. I don't know what to do. Dad said not to call you, but I just thought I'd let you know I love you, bye. And hung up the phone. Two women had notified the office that their bosses had put a hit on me. And one of his brother-in-law was an attorney, and he told them that they had to let me know or they would be complicit and all go to jail. These three nurses wanted to start a company uh, just like mine. Their business plan was that they would take a hit on my life, kill me, and take over my business. That was their business plan. I was like, wow, this is a lot bigger than than I thought, you know, the staffing agency and their rivalry. We didn't know if they were to show up and try to kill me or not. About, about a week goes by, I was still at work, and I got a call from Allie, and all I could hear from in the background was just this bam, 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 wow. And I'm asking her, what is going on? It sounds like a war. And she goes, it's a war. And I got off the phone and I just, started calling everybody I knew. I, I called my son-in-law, I said, grab your gun and get there, quick. I called all the police. I had like, I don't know, 30 to 50 people show up when I showed up. And she immediately slammed on the brakes and reached for a pistol or something and screamed ambush. We of course thought it was like sabotage. Well, what really happened 
was that David always heated the house with, with wood and he cleaned out the fireplace and poured it on his farm hall because it had been raining. It was really just the embers had blown and caught the barn on fire. At that time, we did not know that that's what it was and maybe connected to the hit on my life until David said, I think I did this. So these women got arrested but not prosecuted. And the reason for it was because I didn't die. But it's not a crime to take a bank loan and give someone else the proceeds of that bank loan. They also didn't get their business off the ground. When I started in 2000, I believe Diana was a little under $3 million in revenue. Last year, you're talking about two combined companies at roughly $60 million in revenue in that amount of time. And to know the, the percentages of organizations that reach that level and that ultimately hit the $50 million mark, you know, to know she's in a very small category of, of entrepreneurs that were able to take her business to that level. She's always made money. That's what I tell everybody. I've been keeping her book, so to speak, since 2007. She's always made money. When I met Diana, I had three jobs. I was working in a restaurant, I had a paper route, and I sold Avon. And I worked in the nursing home, so I guess you could consider that four. And about three or four months into that, I was working on a weekend. And she and Mr. Wright walked in the door, and I was seating at the time, I was a hostess. And um, it hurt her to see that I had to work two different jobs. So before she left, she hugged me and asked me to hang in there with her and she would make sure that I succeeded and I actually made over $100,000 the very next year. Diana would always come in and she'd always have this big old stack of papers like this every night when she'd leave, every day when she'd come in. And she just came in one morning, she had her big old stack of papers and she just set them down and looked at me and said, now what can I do to help you? And I was just like, I'm fine. I thought here she is, does all this work, and then asking what she can do to help me. I would come into the building, and the whole place was rearranged. Everybody moved somewhere else. You met new people, and, and you learned how to get along with each one of them. I thought it was brilliant. What struck me right away is, is her, kind of just the motherly um, aspect of, of her, and just very kind and wanted to help people genuinely. Um, and that, that's a big draw to me, and that's why I've been here for so long, honestly, is just the, the vision that she's had and kind of buying into the idea that we want to take care of people. You know, she was more than just a business owner. She was your friend. And, and I think that that's why so many people stayed during difficult times, too, is because it was more than a job. We were in the other bigger building, and I had an office in the back next to Mr. Wright, her husband. He had his office right next to mine, and it was just a small office. And one morning, I glanced over, and Diana was in his office, and I knew something was wrong. So I waited a few minutes, and then I went and got her and asked her to come in my office and close the door, and I said, what's wrong? was it, uh, hospitalized in May of, of 2012 for chest pain. And they had me run a treadmill. She said, oh, it's probably hypertension and esophageal reflux. And I went, no, hell no, it's not esophageal reflux. But I knew that the only way I would be able to get the doctors to look for something else, which was to go ahead and have an EGD and a colonoscopy. We did the EGD, I did have H. pylori, and we did, we did the colonoscopy later that same day. They could see the, the tumors through the colon wall. When I went home that day, I thought we had ovarian cancer in the left ovary. I was like a walking zombie. I could not focus. Allie came to visit and spend the night. She kept saying, Mom, you need to get your CAT scan. You need to get your CAT scan. And so finally, we went up to get the CAT scan. And I was driving, and Allie was sitting in the passenger seat, and she started reading it. 
and she just started saying, Mom, something's wrong, something's wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. She said, what do you think about this? And pushed it across the table. And I was reading and didn't see anything real big. And she took her finger and said, what do you think about that? And it named a mass near the rectum and column, fairly large. And um, I immediately was thinking colon cancer, probably. And I told her, I said, it's, it's not good. And she agreed. And from then on, it was like every day it got worse and worse and worse. She would have to go for another test and then all of a sudden we had ovarian cancer and then and then you know she would go back and it was it was in the uh, it's both ovaries and then the uterus and then you know it got to the point where it was in her abdominal aorta, vena cava, um, and outside of the abdominal cavity which places you at stage four. I didn't know what to think, and I thought, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen now? You know, she's worked so hard for this to happen. She doesn't deserve it. And I actually told her, I wished it was me and not you. I felt really helpless. I felt very helpless at that time because there was nothing I could do for her. I mean, with something like that, there was nothing I could do. Then, after a couple of days, I thought, you idiot, there is something you can do. Go in there and get every nurse you can to go to work and help run her business and keep that going so that's one less worry she has. So that's what I did. I, I went in and I, I done everything I possibly could to get as many as nurses as I could to work. Our person that we respected like almost no other and had our faith in like no other, who led us and you know who was our leader and um, all of a sudden um, is not there and it was just devastating. Friends and family showed up and we rapidly divided into two camps and one camp wanted me to stay home and let them take care of me until I died and the other camp wanted me to go and do whatever I needed to do to live. I got really furious and I said, I've always made my own decisions and I don't know why you people think that I would allow you to make my decisions at this time. I will be making my own decisions. My mom's a fighter. That's all she's ever been. And she's not gonna go out without a fight and that's all I could ever ask for. She said, I'm gonna fight it. She said, I'm gonna do everything and I'm, and I'm gonna fight this. And I'm like, well, if anyone can, Diana, you can do it. I decided to go immediately to get a second opinion at a major cancer uh, hospital in Houston, Texas. I met with the doctor that I was assigned to, and I luckily had the worst doctor at the facility. And I say that, and I'm not even kidding when I say I luckily had the worst doctor at the facility. But I had a good doctor, I might have stayed. Just didn't have any bedside manners, wouldn't talk to you, wouldn't look you at, look in your eye. I hated the, that part of the, the, the medical practice. And she would be there one week, then be gone for two. Every time she walked in, she would say, you'll get better if you decide to respond to the chemotherapy. In my whole career, a whole career, I had never known someone with stage four ovarian cancer to survive up to five years. It's not like a hospital that we know of. It's like a city. It's a complex. And you lose your identity, you become a number. And so they call you by your number. And I, my number was 0699714. They would come to the door and they would scream, 0699714. And you were supposed to recognize your number and get up like you're a prisoner and shuffle forward to do whatever they wanted you to do, whether it be draw blood or receive chemotherapy or see the doctor. They told her they think that the chemo did well, and but the, um, 
outcome didn't change. Her chances for life did not change. She told me I had eight months to live and I probably, probably wouldn't make it that long. And I said, I'm not dying, I have too much to do. She is a marvelous researcher, just phenomenal. And she and David, her husband, had been researching for several uh, weeks, the whole time they were down there, pretty much. When we arrived uh, in Houston, we um, went immediately to Warren's and Noble and bought 20 books, and I read those. And I bought, then went back and bought 20 more. And every time I'd find something pertinent, I'd yellow sticky it and I put it on a, on a wall. And the way I've always solved all my problems is I put my yellow stickies up on the wall and I start moving them around and I put them, you know, where they make sense to me. And she's, well, if you can find any of those things in America, you know, to where I could receive treatment, I do see value in these things. And some of those things were much more off the grid as far as normal treatments were concerned. But she went over uh, four or five that she thought had value. She couldn't find them and she was too sick to look. And so I just um, started studying day and night and, and um, called every um, teaching hospital in the U.S. that I thought had a cancer program and talked to them. Most didn't, or at least said they didn't even know what I was talking about. Some knew, but said, you know, there's no studies going on. I cleaned the entire apartment up because David and I were leaving and we were coming back and we were going to start a circuit tour if we had to. We were going to do something else other than stay where we were. So I called the American Cancer Society last ditch effort. The lady there said, well, you know, we deal with treatments in America, of course. And, and um, she said, I do, I can't think of the man's name, but I do know there is someone in success in Austria. About two days later, called me back and said, this is the guy's name. I had never read my emails. Um, since I left, and as a CEO, I got a thousand per day. And so I did print them off, and I would stack them up. And I, my stack was quite high. I had already called a um, Ralph Moss, Dr. Ralph Moss, who has gone all over the world to watch doctors who are doing cancer treatments different from traditional. He returned my call. My role is to provide them with my understanding of the different options and give them a realistic assessment of the effects uh, and the side effects of different treatments. I told him what I was doing and it looked like there were some European possibilities as far as treatment went. Um, and I already had faith in him because of his credentials were incredible. And what he had done, not only did he go see them, he watched the surgeries, he, he kept track of how successful they were and he knew his stuff. In the stage four setting, chemotherapy by itself uh, gives usually limited value. So it's probably so measured in, uh, in a few months, possibly in some cases in a few weeks. Now there are exceptions here too, but in like in the ovarian cancer case, it's debatable uh, how much benefit the person actually gets out of the chemo. He uh, said, well, which one are you going to? And I think and I said, I, I think I'm gonna try to talk to her about Austria. And he said, Is, are you looking at Dr. Ralph Cleef? I said, I am. And he said, you're gonna do okay. I came back to the apartment and everything was cleaned up. But when I walked in the door, there was a letter that was laying on the, the top of the coffee table and how it wound up from the middle of that stack onto that coffee table was just an act of God. I called his office and his secretary or receptionist answered the phone, spoke English. And um, I got out that I had a friend with cancer and that I just, loved very much and uh, that she was loved by many people and was important. She was very rushed and she said, I'm gonna put you on hold. And that's what the other 150 hospitals did. The next thing I heard was 
Hello, Jan. This is Dr. Ralph Clay. Tell me about your friend. And now when I went over and grabbed the letter, it was one that Jan had written me almost three weeks earlier about the doctor in Vienna, Austria, that was saving women with ovarian cancer. Just an amazing conversation that lasted an hour and a half. I made, I made her an appointment for two weeks down the road. But I hadn't told her. <laughs> I got up the next day and David and I had never been to the zoo, so we decided, well, we'd better go because we're leaving. I went off and left my phone. I want you to know that Dr. Cleve had tried all day long to call me. And he said, take your final chemotherapy, wait five days, and come over here. I said, what? And he said, what are you waiting on to start your healing journey? And I said, uh, my appointment on September the 29th. He goes, I will see you whatever day you show up. He said, what are you waiting for? He said, come now. Pretty quickly, within a couple of weeks, Diana was gone fighting for her life. People were saying 2% chance to make it. I know there was 14 months at one point, eight months at another point. So really, there wasn't too much conversation other than hey, I've, I've got to go, and you're, you're the person to take and lead this company. He had been working with my mom. He had moved into her office to work more closely with her, to, but there was no plans, per se, of you're going to run the company. It literally was kind of a um, decision that was made instantly. She had to fight to survive and, and to make it on her own, to get herself through school, nursing school, and then to start a business as a female. She's a fighter and she's an entrepreneur. She wasn't going to give up and she'll try anything. She'll try anything new. I look at you, oh, okay. okay. My name is Ralph Cleave, I'm a medical doctor. I'm in clinical practice since nearly 30 years. Um, my career as a doctor practicing clinical oncology started in the first and uh, only clinic in Germany which used hypersermia, which is a way to uh, heat up cancer patients, and it immediately attracted my attention. I instantly felt deep, this is something I wanted to do. I was so brainwashed from the American way of doing things where I was explaining, well, my tumor has these markers and these, these genetic components, blah, 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 blah. And he, said, he took my hand and he goes, Mrs. White, I don't care what its name is. I'm going to kill it. I mean, that's all I wanted to hear. And then he grabbed my hand again and he goes, Mrs. White, I am begging you, begging you to get well. I, I felt her power, first of all. I felt her dedication to take up that challenge, which is extremely important, um, which is like a, you know, cancer can be, can be, must not be, a wake-up call. It can destroy you and you, and you don't don't make it. The next day when I showed up, we began the, the IV vitamin C, the alpha lipoic acid. He balanced my supplements. He started me on all kinds of, of other things to build me up for surgery. She was um, threatened by a very far advanced stage four ovarian cancer and uh, she needed immediately treatment. She would have died very fast. and. Um, we knew that we have to take everything from both worlds, so the so-called um, classical school medicine, as well as from the natural dimension. And we design an individual protocol, which is different for every patient. The immunological backbone of the therapy is quite similar, using immunotherapy, but many of the patients get um, tested for targeted uh, chemotherapy, including um, substances like high-dose vitamin C or curcumin or tesonate or dichloacetate. There's a couple of biological uh, metabolic approaches which we also incorporate. That very first night that I was diagnosed, 
only knew allopathic care. I did not know anything hardly about any other type of care. And I said to myself, I can stay with the chemical medicine of man and die, or I can do whatever is out there. I just don't care, I want to be well. My mentor at Sloan Kettering, he was a, a fantastic, um, very famous immunologist. Uh, his name was Dr. Lloyd Old. And he once told me, Ralph, there is no school medicine and uh, alternative medicine, this is a good medicine or bad medicine. Our approach is unique in a way that we combine therapies which, to my knowledge, nobody is co combining. Because we, we filed that um, therapy for international patent application and the lawyers told us, yes, this, you're the first on the planet doing it. In the United States, the, there are certain constructs that have happened over time where a medicine gets approved for lymphoma but you know that it has activity in ovarian cancer and you want to use it in ovarian cancer. But the approval process has not yet gone through the trials to meet that, or the drug company has decided that they don't want to open themselves up to the risk of going back to the FDA and having their medicine looked at again there's less constraint of that in Europe. They can just say, we think that this medicine works and we're gonna put this combination together. So specifically what we combine is immunotherapy with checkpoint inhibitors, with local regional hypersemia, with whole body hypersemia, with a very specific gut microbiome immunomodulation, with long duration whole body hypersemia where we do artificial fever and with uh, fever inducing R2 treatment. And um, that all together is quite a complex process. It's not easy to be done, but it can be done. And it's a lot of work for every patient. It's, it's really a lot of work. But in the end, um, we can show it works. And that's, that's what counts. Right now, we are seeing the fulfillment of the promise that William B. Coley began in 1893 with a very good treatment of his own. Sir William Walter Cooley, the father of cancer immunotherapy in New York City, his wisdom, his clinical experience and his knowledge is still not really accepted. And what, what happened with Cooley was the following. He was a young surgeon and um, at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and he operated the sarcoma of the girlfriend of Rockefeller and was a young young girl, I think she was 16, and he cut off the arm and uh, six months later the girl was dead with lung metastasis and he was extremely frustrated that that will be my life, you know, chopping off limbs and then see them die. So he went to the medical records and found in, in the archives of Sloan Kettering Cancer Center the story of a man who had had a huge head and neck cancer the size of a grapefruit on his neck and that patient one day had a severe infection with erysipelas, streptococcus, and um, developed violent fever and the cancer just shrank and melted away and the patient got cured. And he tracked that patient down and um, he found him and he was alive. And then Cooley said, okay, this I must research and for the rest of his life he injected inactivated bacterial vaccines with gram positive and gram negative bacteria into patients inducing fever. I came into this field in 1974 when immune therapy was basically illegal. You had a kind of a, a blacklisting of non-conventional cancer treatments uh, that included all the cutting edge immune therapy uh, treatments. The American Cancer Society, to its eternal disgrace, maintained a list of unwanted, uh, so-called unproven treatments while they promoted chemo and surgery and radiation therapies. One of my most important um, commandments 
in my personal life as a doctor is in God we trust, all others must bring data. So if you don't go the, the classical pathway and you go new pathways, you have to be able to critically evaluate your own work and you have to be able to show what you do. And you have to be able to um, show your, your failures and your successes. Now in the end, this is of a course called um, clinical studies, prospective randomized clinical studies. In the moment we are not doing those because we don't have the sponsor for that because these clinical studies are very, very expensive and you need, need a good sponsors and millions of, of dollars for that. But at least we are documenting all our many, many single cases. My name is Michael. I'm a music producer slash DJ. Um, I met Dr. Clave like eight months ago for the first time. I have a history with cancer. I had cancer in my throat four, four times now. And last time it was pretty bad. The doctors just gave me a few weeks to live. So I met Dr. Clave and he told me about his immune fever therapy. He had laser surgeries again and again and again. And um, in the end, there was nothing more to be cut away because otherwise they would just have uh, would have destroyed his vocal cords and they said look you have to have laryngectomy which is a scientific word for taking it all out or you have to have a CV I mean really aggressive radiation which also will literally leave you debilitated and they told me if I'm not going to do any of that um, that I have like eight to twelve weeks to live I had a tumor here you could see it from outside you could feel it and see it and um, after four months of, of cleansing my body and of preparing, I met Dr. Clave. And then we did this therapy. It was like having fever, high fever for, for a long time. But beside that, I had no side effect at all. I was feeling great. And the thing just went away. And it, after four weeks, you couldn't feel anything. And after six weeks, we did an MRT and there was, there was nothing to see anymore. And what was really amazing was, and he went back to the university clinic and said, hey guys, look, we have the results of the laryngoscopy where the ear, nose, jaw doctor looks inside. We have the results of the MRI, clearly proven the complete remission. And they brushed it off and said, you are just lucky. You're one of the few who get spontaneous remission, you know. They didn't want to hear that this patient had had immunotherapy, had had hypersemia. And I think that's kind of sad, and that's why I'm um, hoping that, that one day people will listen to us. How in the world can I face the end of my life when I had so much to live for? All my girls were pregnant, everything at the office going, going well, I loved my employees. Um, I love my nurses, I love my husband. I couldn't imagine that my life would be ending so quickly. You stay awake at night trying to figure out if something happened to her, what would you do, and what your life would be like, and you know, how could you, you know, it'd be, it'd be the end of the world for you. I went for surgery on October the 1st. They did an MRI and a, an ultrasound the day before surgery and could not find any tumor. So they thought their equipment was broken. He came back and says, I opened her up, I looked, I looked, I looked, I looked, I looked. He didn't find any signs of tumors. The reality is I went from stage four end stage, ovarian cancer to having nothing in a three month period of time. You know, that was, to me, that was a miracle. I stayed with Dr. Clee from September the 17th until December the 8th. I was declared free of treatment and to go home for Christmas. The time that we spent together in Vienna were good times, really, because we were one-on-one. -on -one. You don't ever get that. And I, when you got as many people as we got in our lives, and uh, so that was special. Our best time is when we're together. I think the beauty of that treatment is if it works, it, it also builds up a 
a, a memory in the body, you know. It's not that you just cut the cancer out, it's, it's that the, the body itself learns to detect that cancer and, and then, like in Diana's case, lead to long-lasting remission. Diana, my God, uh, you know I was always was thinking of you. Diana Wright has a company called The Wright Solution. That's, that's right. That's it. That's it. <laughs> I love you. So, oh, oh, you look so good. I'm so happy. And you look so good too. You look healthy. Well, you yeah. know, I asked my grandmother one day, she was 93, grandmother, how you get so old? And she flashed a smile at me and said, work my boy, work. <laughs> that's probably true. <laughs> You know, when I came out of surgery in October of, of 12, uh, to, they, they said that they saw no cancer. They couldn't find any cancer. Um, the individual that, uh, that operated on me, he, he did abdominal surgery for over eight hours every day, six, six days a week. And he had spent extra, extra time looking for cancer because they had a report of cancer and there was no cancer. Now, many different schools of thought go along with that. One, that the chemotherapy got rid of the cancer. Two, that all the, all the treatments that I had to build up my immune system got rid of the cancer. All the self-treatments that I did before, I mean, as soon as I got diagnosed with cancer, the alkaline water, the diet, the, um, the supplements, the energy medicine, the decrease in the stress, the, uh, the increasing the positive affirmations, you know, all these things to change the milieu is uh, what I did. Maybe that helped to get rid of cancer. The, the bottom line is that you need to make your body a terrain that cancer doesn't want to grow in. I think it is absolutely wrong if an oncologist or radiation oncologist uh, is telling a patient, look, this is incurable. Who knows? There are so many stories which, which prove the opposite. I was diagnosed in 2010 with stage four uh, lymphoma. My, really, my only chance of long-term survival was to do a allogeneic bone marrow transplant. The chemotherapy did not work at all, which kind of much to everybody's surprise. And then I uh, couldn't find a match donor. So I was in a situation where traditional chemotherapy, traditional type treatments, were not on the table anymore. That was the setup for a phone call I got from Diana Wright, man. She, who are you? I'm Diana Wright. I'm, well, okay. She said, I'd like to meet with you and help you. I hear you're, you're struggling with, uh, you know, with your condition, with your cancer. Diana helped me realize that, you know, if, if I kind of looked at it like the cancer cell was a dragon and we need to destroy it. And we were taking high doses of uh, curcumin and uh, all these other uh, alpha-lipoic acid, resveratrol, um, uh, EGCG, green tea extract. I was shaving and I was, you know, putting on my aftershave and I always, I was kind of doing that and going, hold on just a second, I'm, I'm not, so something's going on here. I didn't feel the tumors. And then I started running my hands around my clavicle because there was some of them sticking up there and I didn't feel anything. 
And I was going, Aaron, come here. She, I said, can you feel anything? She's like, oh my God, Daddy, oh. This was a, probably three weeks after I was, the doctors did a, a PET scan on me and there was zero cancer. And so I'm reading this. I says, Diana, I am uh, sitting here getting infused with my vitamin C. I wanted to do, uh, uh, take this time to extend my gratitude to you. God has quite a way of putting people's paths on a collision course. Um, I was in a very difficult spot when I met you, and I have told the story to many people, the way you coached me up and destroying this disease and becoming well again. It is truly amazing. When we first met, it was uh, so much information. It was like drinking out of a fire hose. <laughs> now I get it, and I'm truly amazed by the results. Thank you from the depths of my heart for reaching out to me, Diana. God is good. You have helped me so and, and so many people. I hope I can do the same thing for others. I celebrate with you, your health and wellness. We surely can live out and thrive even an awful diagnosis of stage four cancer. I continue to do the things you coach me on. I feel better than ever, and I'm looking forward to many years of grateful living. You are a true servant of God. Straight ahead, Jeff Courtway. My goal right now is to establish in everyone's mind that they have other options, that they have options that can possibly save their life. I can't make a guarantee, like no doctor can make a guarantee that he can save a cancer patient's life, but we can try. And in the, in the process of pro trying, we need to figure out why the only brand of medicine that is not paid for by insurance is naturopathic medicine. It's just an amazing story that she's still here and beating the odds. And um, I'm so glad that she's done and taken the path that she's taken. And now she's trying to help other people. Uh, which is uh, amazing to see and just seeing the hope uh, she gives other people um, because they've been where she's been. Her story is phenomenal, but what's so inspiring to me about it is that my mother was just never a woman of words. If she said something, she did it. I can think of a lot of broken promises in my life, but never one that came from her. People are very grateful here. They recognize her as a hero for us.